So now I want to talk about cooling systems. So you have the concept of how <coughs> cooling happens. And when you're designing a summer cooling system, we need to think about <coughs> how many air exchanges we need. And this is usually calculated in cubic feet per minute. Now in a greenhouse, for uh, pad and fan cooling systems work, we typically uh, look at a recommendation of one air exchange per minute. That, what that means is we're taking all the volume of that greenhouse and we're taking it and pulling it out and replacing it with fresh air once a minute, the entire volume. Now you might think that that's going to blow your hair, but it won't. That's what the greenhouses are currently are designed to do, one air exchange per minute. And we use a rule of thumb of eight cubic feet per minute per square foot. Now that implies that our sidewalls are eight foot high. If they're 10 foot, you need to use a 10 foot. If they're 12 foot, a 12 foot. And we typically design our greenhouse volume for the volume underneath the bottom cord of the truss. We don't take into account the, the gable because that air pretty much stays up there. So first thing we need to do is take into account the light intensity uh, that we're dealing with in our greenhouse. We're going to also take into account the elevation. And we need to take into account what was called the maximum temperature rise in our greenhouse. So we set up a series of what we call F values. I call them fudge vectors. And we have F sub house. And we calculate the F sub elevation, F sub light, and the F sub temperature. Now, this F, this temperature value, typically we use that value based upon a greenhouse that's 100 feet long. It's more efficient to pull our, our air 100 feet than it is to pull our air 35 feet. So if it's a shorter typical system, we use what's called a value of velocity. And we calculate both of these uh, based on tables that we'll use in lab next week to determine how this all works. So this is from your textbook. These are the factors for air removal. This is for your F sub elevation. So a greenhouse under 1,000 feet elevation, the value is 1. If we go up to Colorado at 5,000 feet, it's 1.2. Okay, And we use these numbers to multiply times the cubic feet per minute we need. So if I have a 50 by 100 foot greenhouse with an 8 foot sidewall, 50 times 100 times 8, 5,000 is 40,000 cubic feet. So I need to move 40,000 cubic feet of air per minute out of that greenhouse. And that means I just have to size my fan. With this fudge factor, I take that 40,000 and multiply it times 1.2. OK? Question? What happens if you have like a Quonset hut? Like, where do you draw the line? Of where do you draw the line in a Quonset hut? We actually use a different calculation value for Quonsets, yeah. We'll do that next week in lab. And uh, for light intensity, most, we look at 5,000 uh, 5, foot candles of light as our standard. If we're going to shade our greenhouse to 4,000, we can multiply it times 0.8. Or if we're expecting it to be a high light intensity area like it is in Colorado, around 7,000, we use a value of 1.4. Okay. In a standard greenhouse 100 feet long, from the pad to the fan, we typically see approximately a 7 degrees Fahrenheit rise as the air moves across the greenhouse. So the 7 is 1. If we, wanted, if we were OK with letting it go higher, which most people aren't, that would be a 10 degree difference from the pad to the fan. We can do smaller. If we want to make it lower, if we want only a 4 degree difference, we have to speed the air movement up. Make sense? So we take these values and push them together. Of course, if we have shorter houses, we have these, these values if the, sh the greenhouse is shorter. 
We look at that too. So we take that difference and we multiply our volume of our greenhouse and we multiply, so we, for instance, if we have a 50 by 100 greenhouse, okay, that's 50,000 square, 50,000 cubic feet times 8, 40,000 cubic feet. So we look at our fans and we look to see how many cubic feet per minute we need to move out of that greenhouse. And this second column here, third column actually, we can see that, for instance, a 54 inch fan, a one horsepower 54 inch fan is going to move 22,660 cubic feet per minute. So we're probably going to need two of those, right? Now, a 54 inch fan, let's see, I'm five foot seven. 54 inches is what, right about here? Because 60 inches is 5 feet, right? Okay. So that kind of puts it in perspective how big of a fan we're using. So it's not this massively monster fan. And you'll notice that we've got two values here. These are, uh, this is the horsepower of the fan, how big the motor is. This is <coughs> the cubic feet per minute at 0.1 inches of water. Okay. It's used with a manometer, measured with a manometer. 0.1 inches is a fan that's built straight up and down. If it's 0.05, it's at an angle. Remember we talked about fans that are slant angled? Those are more efficient because they match the angle of the louver. So we need to know the total fan cubic feet per minute based upon our cooling requirements. We want the fans to be equal to the cubic feet per minute required for that greenhouse <coughs> Under moderately extreme conditions, you don't want to design it for average. We place the fans on op one opposite end of the wall, <coughs> pad on the opposite end. Maximum distance is 200 feet. Preferentially, most people do it about 100 feet. Close to plant height is optimal. And we don't want the fans any further than 25 feet apart. Because if they're further than 25 feet apart, we're going to have big hot spots in our greenhouse. So here's an example of a barrel vault where we've got these uh, the vents and the cooling pad and the fans and the air moves from right to left in the bottom diagram. Pretty simple. Ordinarily in gutter connect greenhouses we like to build them so they're running perpendicular to the gutters. Because what that does is it drives the air down to the plant height. If we're pulling the length of a greenhouse, what happens is as the air moves through the greenhouse, it's warming up. And as it warms up, it climbs. So what some growers will do, if they're not running them across the vents, they'll hang baffles to keep the greenhouse uh, more uniform. And like I said, the typical rise across the greenhouse is 7 degrees Fahrenheit, if it's designed correctly. All right. So individual fan cubic feet per minute, total cubic feet, do we, do we get that, is we need to find out, uh, t use the total cubic feet per minute who wrote that formula? Um, we need to have the number of fans we're going to use. So you got your total cubic feet per minute. I'm going to put, for instance, if we're going to do 40,000 uh, cubic feet, and if I want two fans, that's two fans to do 20,000 cubic feet per minute to give me a pretty good capacity. We always want to put the fans on the leeward side of the prevailing wind. Okay, if you put it on the windward side of the prevailing wind, the fans are always fighting the wind, and pushing against a static pressure, and that's not efficient. You want to have it on the op. We take advantage of mu as much of the natural wind as we can, um, because if you're putting it on the windward side, you're going to have to have at least 10 percent more, and 50 percent, 50 feet minimum. We don't like to have fans blowing directly into the vent of a neighboring greenhouse. 
I'd like to have at least 50 feet difference between those two spots. Because if we're just taking that hot air and pushing it into another greenhouse, it, that greenhouse isn't going to work very effectively. And also, if we've got a nice little white fly outbreak in one greenhouse and we suck it out and push it into the neighboring greenhouse, we're just causing the neighboring greenhouse more trouble. Slat wall housing. Um, this uh, single design here makes the fans more efficient. Fan louvers. We like to use uh, fan louvers that are mechanized and not ones that are just relying on the, the power of the wind to open them. Uh, it makes them more efficient. I uh, want to make sure that pads or uh, fans are placed appropriately. This uh, bottom um, left-hand photograph is from Gully Greenhouses. And you can see that the louvers are on the inside of the fans and they're slant wall housing. And um, by having multiple fans, depending on how much cooling is required, we're only turning on a few fans at once. So if we only need about two to three degrees of cooling, one fan turns on. Five to 10 degrees of cooling, another fan turns on, all the way up to maximum cooling. Um, this top picture is a, is a old style vent design. It's got a cantilevered hinge uh, that opens up the fan. Um, this middle picture is, uh, shows some uh, fans um, in a line. Here we have cooling pads. And it's hard to see in these uh, barrel vaults, but there's actually a frame over the, the inlet vents of this particular operation for um, insect screen. Again, I want to operate, put my fans opposite the prevailing winds. Here we have um, separated systems. The pads in this le left two are, are, are together. The fans here are actually offset, so they're not blowing directly into each other. Um, this is the ideal layout for a greenhouse like that. The greenhouses should be at least 15 feet apart. I don't want the fans closer than 25 if they're blowing directly into each other. and on the clearance of about one and a half times the diameter to give our cells adequate clearance. When um, on the far left hand side would be the interior of the greenhouse and as the fan is pushing air out, pulling air out of the greenhouse and blowing it, remember that we have hot spots uh, around the wind vortices and so typically where the fans are located, we'll not put benches right up against the fan wall. We want to have the, fan, the benches back from the fan wall a couple of feet so we can eliminate those hot spots because right next to where the fan is on either side, those uh, areas don't get a lot of air movement. And here's another picture giving you a clearer picture of how those um, openings, how the air works. So fans is basically a propeller. It, it's got a pulley, it's got a motor, it's got belts, it's got louvers. All these things are mechanical pieces of equipment that need to be uh, managed on a regular basis. Uh, you need to keep belts on hand and these sorts of things. And everybody needs to know how to change a, a fan belt. Cooling pads, the old design is what we call Excelsior or Aspen pad cooling. And this is just a, a, a mesh of uh, wood, shredded wood fibers in, um, sandwiched in between uh, some metal uh, fencing material or chicken wire or something. And they last about two years, whereas the modern cross-fluted cellulose, Cool Cell is a brand, they're more expensive, but they last longer and they're more efficient. So this picture on the left is an Aspen pad system. And this is what you typically see uh, in most of the swamp coolers. Uh, you'll also see um, there are some uh, uh, fibers, some synthetic fiber mats that you can buy too to retrofit these that last longer. Um, but how they work is we have a pipe along the top that trickles water through the aspen pad, saturates that, the aspen pad with water. Air moves across the pad as it's drawn into the greenhouse by the fans. What is not evaporated collects in the trough underneath 
and it is recirculating. The cool cell pad on the right, uh, or the cross-fluted cellulose, this is the design that most people are going for <coughs> because it lasts longer, looks neater, looks tighter, it's easier to manage. Um, it's important that when you size your fan systems that you side your pad wall to the right size. So we use a set of formulas where we want to make sure that we take, we design our cubic feet per minute first and then we size our pad wall to the fan velocity. So we take the total <coughs> cubic feet per minute by the, to calculate the pad velocity and that gives us our square feet of pad area. And depending on what size you're using, how thick the pad is, et cetera, et cetera, we use those particular numbers to calculate. And we also have to make sure we get the pad pump sized correctly so we're not pushing too much water or pushing enough water. And we need to have a sump pump holding capacity to circulate the water. And of course, the capacity is based upon how big the pad area is. So if we're using the, the Aspen pad or the Excelsior, we need about uh, 150 square feet, 150 feet per minute, 150 square feet per cubic foot per minute. So in other words, we take that fan velocity. So if we've got 40,000, we divide that by 150, and that gives us how many cubic feet we need of pad surface area. With the cross-fluted cellulose and uh, the four-inch pads or the six-inch pads, of course, they get more efficient. So we're dividing that cubic feet by 250 or dividing by 350, and it gives us how many square feet of pad surface area we need. And then the number, this is um, the water flow rate based upon how many gallons per minute you need per linear foot of pad surface. And this uh, sump capacity is how many cubic, how much, how big of a volume we have to have of our tank system for it to work. Now we want to make sure that that pad runs the full length of the greenhouse, okay? We want it to have good cooling um, we bleed a little water off because otherwise it'll just build up salt all the time. So we have to have a bleed and we use an algicide to prevent things from growing in our pad. The pad uses a sump pump and delivery tubes and such as this. Most of them, the water tubes spray the water up hits the top of the distribution and then trickles the water then sprays down and uniformly distributes along the pad and of course the bottom gutter. So here's the basic design. The, the supply line is here on the top. Goes the length underneath this metal uh, cowling which is usually sheet metal and the water sprays up, hits the surface of the sheet metal, trickles down through the pad captured in the gutter that runs to a sump pump and is recirculated. Here's a graphic of the bleed line. In the bleed line, what that does is keeps the water from building up a lot of uh, salts in the system. And also, if you don't have the bleed line in, the water won't go the full length of the pipe. And again, you can see the, they call it an impingement cover. The water distributes, air moves across, and it's collected in the bottom. And we don't want <laughs> to have the pad sitting directly in the gutter. We want to have a little bit of a space so the water flows smoothly through the system. Um, here we see a vent. Typically, we want to have that pad inside the greenhouse or in an area where it's not going to freeze if you need to have chill water, or they'll take the water out in the wintertime. This picture here is an old greenhouse uh, that we used to have here on campus, and you can see the aspen pad that's old and worn out that hasn't, that's kind of started to shrink away. And this is a photograph from your book. Here's a mat, these are photographs, of, again, from your textbook of massive um, cooling wall. I typically don't like to design a greenhouse with a cooling wall through the door in the middle 
because right where that door is, you're going to have hot spots, of course. Question. <coughs> have you ever seen the pad cooler that they have in the new business building? In the new business building? I have not. It's pretty cool. You might want to check it out because it cools the whole building. It's like in the basement. And they have this huge like, pad system. Mm hmm. Well, actually, there is a water chiller on this building that they're, that's going to eventually run the air conditioning, and it's on the roof. And it's a, uh, a massive evaporative, chill, uh, evaporative cooler that works same way, but it's, use, it's using glycol to move the water through. Yeah, but, it's pretty cool over there. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. So here are some acid pads on the left that are need a, need a repair. And... Uh, here we can see across fluid cellulose where they haven't been putting enough algaecide in the system. And you can see the algae. Actually, this particular greenhouse, there were bromeliads growing in the pad. Um, and when I see a dry spot like this in the middle, that tells me that there's a, one of the little uh, water orifices is clogged up and causing that, that dry spot. So Because uniformity is very important. Because air is going to take the path of least resistance. Okay. So it's going to have a tendency to, um, if we have all these gaps, the air is going to go through the gaps before it goes through the cooling pad. So I want to force as much of the air into the cooling pad as possible. OK, question. Can you clean those? Can you clean the pads? Yes, you can clean the pads. Um, most people will clean them. You can, you can power wash them. They come pretty clean with a power washer. Um, we had a little incident at, at Perk at Christmas time, just before Christmas. Somebody dumped a bucket of fertilizer in the cooling pad sump, thinking it was a drain. And first of all, I'm going, why are you dumping fertilizer in a drain? Next question is, all that f water full of fertilizer is pumped through my cooling pads. And within days, the cooling pad was solid blech. And it took poor Nick a week to clean. Ask him about it. Of course I made him do it. He didn't even tell me until it was all done. Anyway, yeah, he had to, the thing is that he had to power wash the whole thing and then he had to clean out the sump because all that stuff went into the sump and we didn't want to recirculate it back. So probably a pretty good algae growing system. So anyway, so if anybody wants to have fun with Nick, tell him that you're going to ask him, should we dump the fertilizer into the sump? Will you do it? You're going to tell him that you're going to do it? Yeah. Get him going. So, OK, so that's basically how pad and fan cooling systems work. Fog cooling is basically still evaporative cooling, but we're not using a pad. And it's not really fog, it's more of a mist. Because fog is actually water that's already evaporated into the air. And so it's kind of a misnomer. All right, So it's actually where we're taking water under high pressure, we're atomizing it in small nozzles, about half to 50 microns. And as those droplets are sprayed into the air on this fine mist, they're evaporating and doing the same sensible heat exchange. So we're actually having to put in about 0.03 to 0.04 <coughs> gallons per hour per square foot. And you can do this either with a passive cooled, passive cooled system or an active cooled system. I see a lot of propagation and plug houses using this as passive because they want the humidity high. If you want the humidity lower, you use the fans. So we're going to put about 80% of our fog nozzles closer to the vent and distribute it 20% of the rest of the fog nozzles throughout the vent. I've, there are some growers will put fog nozzles and evaporative cooling pads to reduce that 7 degree rise across the greenhouse. The old rose growers used to do that all the time because they wanted to have their whole row to harvestable at the same time. <coughs> Same cubic feet per minute requirements as cooling fads. Everything else is the same. Inlet area is based upon the air velocity. Uh, we need to have an uh, inlet of 700 <coughs> feet per minute per where we're looking at the pad surface area. Uh, 
Take the total cubic feet per minute divided by 700 gives us how much vent space we have to have open. And we have, these are, again, photographs from your textbook, where we, this is a me fog. <coughs> that's a brand. They use stainless steel tubing with an impeller pin. And high pressure is about 1,200 pounds per square inch is sprayed through here. We have a massive filter system. The 500, uh, where 1,200 pounds per square <laughs> inch water hits that pin, uh, puts the water particles into micron size, and evaporates. And this looks like a um, greenhouse full of uh, propagation greenhouse full of pothos. Um, this is a plug production greenhouse where the fog is. There's no. Um, they're using the fog to maintain the humidity. But if we put a fan on that started pulling the air slower, we typically slow the air down a little bit, we can cool the massive cooling. This is the May fog system. This is the Cadillac of fog out there. Of course, that means it costs the most money. Um, and it's a stainless steel tube that's got to be welded together with an O-ring, little filter, and the part that wears out on this system is actually the nozzle body. And it has to be replaced about once every five years. Don't you have to worry about mold more with the fog system? Do you have to worry about mold more with the fog system? The answer is yes. You're going to have higher humidity, um, <coughs> but you, ha you do have the, po the possibility of having more foliar-borne uh, pathogens. But if you keep your greenhouse clean, it's not that big a deal. So. This is a, a full fog system. Here on the bottom is the high pressure pump. And up here we have our water treatment systems for filtration. And this is a massive filter over here on the left. So some people will use a timer. Some people use a humidistat. Or you can use it for cooling, where you can run it through a stage cooling system. The water has to be absolutely pure, very clean. No minerals, no, has to be pure. Uh, cooling fission is, is, is greater with fog. If you're using passive ventilation, you have less, less electricity. Um, and with exhaust fans, you have a lower temperature rise if it's designed correctly. Uh, most of the time when we design these systems, it's good to use the company that manufactures the system to design it for you. You can use them for high humidity for plant propagation rather than using a mist bench. Um, the idea behind fog versus uh, a regular mist line is the, s the droplets are smaller and we're less likely to have liquid water forming on the leaf. When we have liquid water forming on the leaf. That's what sets us up for uh, diseases and pathogens. So oftentimes, if we're monitoring our relative humidity, we can stay um, relatively disease free. OK. Winter cooling. Winter cooling is uh, something we need to focus on during the wintertime where we have bright, sunny days. And we need to have something, some kind of a mixing process so we don't chill our plants when it comes right in through the vent. So the, the concepts of winter cooling is we use an exhaust fan, either moving slow or only one fan, to remove the hot air and perhaps vent just to let in a little of the air at a time, and a <coughs> cold air distribution system with the HAF fans or that jet tube. The jet tube was really designed for winter cooling as much as anything else, where we can open up this vent to the left and pull the air through that uh, jet tube. In fact, you don't even need a pressurizing fan uh, if, <coughs> if this is connected directly to the louver. If you pull the exhaust fan, if this uh, jet tube is connected directly to the louver, as the air is brought in, the fan, the jet tube will actually inflate because it's pulling a slight vacuum. And here's another one. And here's an example of the Acme jet tube system. Like I said, if you connect those two, you take that gap out. But see, a lot of people will put uh, a unit heater next to that to uh, use that as a distribution system as well. So the calculations is the standard requirement versus eight is now we use two cubic feet per minute. 
And of course, you've got to pull in the same fudge factors as you would with anything else. And in lab, we'll do these calculations. They're not hard. And your winter tool tooling requirements is based upon the difference between your greenhouse temperature and the outdoor temperature. So, question. <coughs> yeah, I was reading about like the subterranean cooling methods in the winter where you just suck it, the hot air and store it in the ground. Correct. Cool the greenhouse. And they were saying that you can have like a lack of CO2 if you do that because you're not pulling any air from the outside. That's true. Okay, so. What he's talking about is we're looking at that Hobbit greenhouse design uh, on Tuesday, the Hobbit house greenhouse design, where we're pulling air, we're recirculating the air through the, the gravel beds itself. So we're not pulling in any outside air at all. And what happens over time is the plants will eventually exhaust the amount of CO2. So you need to have a constant supply of fresh air coming into the greenhouse, which is the cheapest and easiest to solve or inject CO2. And they also said that you might be able to use a propane burner because propane emits CO2. Propane, yes, gives off CO2. And we'll talk about CO2 injection in a couple of weeks. Okay. So okay. That's a, that is a, because we can all, oftentimes, we'll inject as much as 1,500 parts per million CO2 into a greenhouse to stimulate plant growth. If you're heating with a, an unvented heater, you can actually collect CO2. But unvented heaters in Colorado are not legal, but yet a propane burner that burns and releases CO2 is. It's zoning rules. <laughs> you know, so if it's called a CO2 burner, it's not judged under the same rules as a, as a heater. Are you confused? Right. They're zoned, their purposes to they're zoned, they're zoned, their zone, specifications have different purposes, so they don't fall into the same rules. Because we can only put in one, 35 BTUs per square foot in an unvented heater on the front range of Colorado, which is basically about as much as you could do to keep a garage warm. Because uh, um, unvented heaters are, are not efficient at 5,000 feet above sea level, unless they're designed to be operated at that level. And what happens is there's a lot of potential for carbon monoxide in that system. And so the, um, you, the city zoning rules to protect you, because they, th they think they're protecting the populace from poorly designed heating system to prevent carbon monoxide poisoning. That's why. But when we start working with greenhouses, we're working with people that understand the gas relationships. So Joe, Bo Joe Plummer doesn't worry about these things. So, OK. Just run your fans at lower speeds. Um, winter cooling we, is best to distribute it through convection tubes. Um, you can use HAF fans, um, so forth. This is a typical design um, where it's necessary to use heating and cooling <coughs> and summer cooling all in the same day. So we want to integrate the system. And next week in class, we're going to talk about environmental control systems or st uh, where we stage our units to operate, to maintain a good, consistent environment. And again, this is the um, ACME cooling system. I've, in your reading assignments, there is an ACME book that you can uh, look that's got all, all the pictures and stuff and how these things are designed. Swamp coolers um, for hobby greenhouses or small greenhouses. This is basically an evaporative cooling system where we've got an evaporative pad on three sides and a fan with a squirrel cage fan blowing in the air. One of the things I showed you over by the insectary, that's another type of forced air system. Where you'd use a forced air cooling system is if you want to, it's, you can use these technologies to keep uh, positive pressure in a greenhouse rather than sucking air in. It's easier to keep insects out. So people will use 
positive pressure cooling systems in greenhouses where we want to have uh, lower, in, lower numbers of insect vectors.